right, well, thank you all for uh, coming to see this. Today we're going to talk about, uh, let's call it a speculative uh, foray into a new way of thinking about thought experiments, or at least a bit of a different way of thinking about thought experiments. This, uh, this talk was born out of the slow realization I had over the course of the past year or so that uh, Lakatos, who I thought would be just a little footnote in my dissertation, is actually a major character in my dissertation. Uh, my work on thought experiments sort of naturally evolved into this uh, in a slightly Lakatosian way. And in this talk, I've decided to take out all the Lakatosian mottos that I found useful for my developing th uh, thinking about thought experiments and show how they can work. So the question that's going to uh, drive this is the value of a false thought experiment. What can we do with a thought experiment that presumes something that's totally impossible? <laughs> thought experiments are a ubiquitous feature of science, after all. They've been part of what we can call science from the very start of science, no matter where you want to say that science starts. Uh, however, they've had their critics for basically just as long. Uh, after all, as uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn put it in his paper on thought experiments, they're an intrinsic impossibility with thought experiments, right? How can you get something out of nothing? How can you get learn something about the world simply by imagining it? Your evidence is coming out of nowhere. And a common response to this kind of worry is to uh, sort of brush it away with the claim that, don't worry, the fictional elements of a thought experiment are somehow dispensable. You don't need those. They're just there to make your life more convenient. And if you wanted to reduce it to only saying true things about real stuff, you certainly could. But why would you even do it the more fun way? Uh, for instance, in John Norton's often cited definition of a thought experiment, he lists one of the relevant uh, necessary components of a thought experiment to be particulars that are irrelevant to the generality of the conclusion. And the irrelevance is key. But what if we have a different kind of problem on our hands, huh? What if we have a really good looking thought experiment, one that does something that we really want it to do, and it invokes particulars that are not uh, dispensable? They are, in fact, right at the heart of the thought experiment doing something very important. What then? What could be the value of a thought experiment like that? And one thing we could say about the value of a thought experiment that, has, uh, that contains uh, falsehood from the very beginning uh, would be to look at uh, what Lakatos has to say on the issue. This is from right at the start of Proofs and Reputations. It's not quite the first mention of thought experiment, but it's the one I thought would be a clearer example. Uh, in the voice of the teacher, uh, Lakatos uh, points out that uh, a, even a proof of a false theorem even be said to have completely misfired if you, for the time being, agree to my early proposal to use the word proof for a thought experiment which leads to the decomposition of the original conjecture into subconjectures instead of guarantee of certain truth. Uh, and this is the, uh, and that thing, that uh, decomposition of subconjectures, regardless of the truth of the proposition, can still be very interesting. Yeah. This is kind of a weird passage from the perspective of the literature on thought experiments. Uh, even if it's not so weird in the context of Lakatos' own thought. Uh, it's not very normal to associate thought experiments with finding falsehood. After all, uh, most of the accounts of thought experiments in the literature are trying really hard to justify how they can find the truth. Uh, finding falsehoods with the imagination is easy, right? We do that all the time. <laughs> but uh, it gave, this past, reading this passage again recently gave me a kind of idea. So, what I'm going to try to do in this talk is show you uh, what happens if we apply that analogy in reverse. Let's say that we're totally on board with Lakatos' uh, theory of mathematics, and we want to take it and show that a thought experiment is like a Lakatosian proof, rather than the other way around. If we apply this, does, is the account we get out of the mix any good? And I'm going to say that it is good. Uh, though it has one important caveat that we will come to. Uh, if you read the paper version, which uh, got circulated with the abstracts in its entirety for some reason, uh, <laughs> uh, you'll notice that it has a couple of uh, toy examples of this as well, but I've eliminated them for time. 
If you want to ask the questions about them, though, I'm very happy to uh, talk about how we fit into all this. So from the, the, uh, the method presented in Proofs and Reputations, let's draw out a couple of characteristics uh, that we might be able to apply to thought experiments. We can boil that quote we just read into two main points. That thought experiments are for more than just establishing the truth of the proposition, uh, and what they could do instead is expose the hidden contents of the, uh, our representations. Whether or not they do establish the truth of the proposition is, I would say, irrelevant to the success of the thought experiment. And uh, a consequence of that is that the useful part of the thought experiment is that kind of dialectical call and response process that draws out the, uh, the implied uh, hidden levels. And the second thing we can draw out is that uh, a thought experiment can investigate a false theory or inaccurate representation just as fruitfully as a uh, true or accurate one. Truth is no impediment to the usefulness of a thought experiment. And just for good measure, I've struck, tossed in a claim from later in the book that one thing that can come out of thought experiments is concept stretching. Yeah. Now, if you're familiar with the literature on thought experiments, all three of these claims are controversial, at least to some degree. Um, I don't know of anybody who would legally assert all of them. Uh, the closest is probably Kuhn's own account of thought experiments, which does, uh, I think, is, I think, compatible with one and two, um, but the third, or it, it's definitely compatible with the first, uh, but the second and third, uh, it only partially ascends to in certain revolutionary contexts. Uh, but for instance, John Norton and Jim Brown are off at the first stop uh, because they want conclusions of thought experiments to be true. But here's our important thing. It may seem like my uh, attempt to make a lactose unit out of thought experiments falls at the very first hurdle when you start to look at the history of thought experiments. You're probably already picturing the most canonical examples of thought experiments in science. For instance, the uh, Galileo dropping a light body and a heavy body off of a very hot, tall tower. Uh, and if you're familiar with the presentation of that as it typically goes in a thought experiment paper, it doesn't look anything like proofs and reputations. It looks like a beautiful little uh, parable at, at the end of which you're set with a beautiful certain truth. Uh, of course, the caveat is that uh, these are typically single paragraph summaries of what Galileo did rather than Galileo's mm -hmm. own depiction of the event, which is rather longer and a little bit more complicated. So in order to make the case for an account of thought experiments that has these features, I need to have a very special kind of example in mind. I need to do this, essentially the same thing that Proofs and Reputations does, show the entire history of a thought experiment to show how all the bits came together. And these are typically hard to find in the literature because we don't, uh, thought experiments are indeed typically uh, presented as a fait accompli. They're already finished. But I think uh, I have such a special example in mind. A, a case of a thought experiment that is presented in a way that shows its entire conceptual development from stem to stern. It's got all the messy stuff left in. So let's talk a bit about it. So our subject today is going to be Ludwig Boltzmann's great paper of 1877 uh, on the relationship between the second fundamental theorem of heat and probability calculations regarding the conditions for thermal equilibrium. A name that is too long for me to say twice. Uh, I will call it the 1877 paper out. The conclusion of this paper is likely familiar to everyone in this room, uh, certainly everyone who's done study thermodynamics at some point in their life. It is the complexion counting paper, you know, that one. Uh, uh, the result that comes out of the, this thought experiment is the complexion counting approach to determining the multiplicity of a gas as it gets linked up to the entropy. Uh, and establishes the approach of a gas to equilibrium from the microphysics rather than just from the macrophysics. It's a uh, massively important result. Uh, I could not overstate, in fact, how important that result is for the foundation of statistical physics. Um, but we're not going to talk about the conclusion in this room. You all know that. We're going to talk about the journey. Because, oddly enough, although the end result of this paper is uh, 
generally available in any statistical physics textbook you happen to pick up, um, as well as in several masterful uh, presentations of Boltzmann's work, like uh, Ethan's 2007 uh, compendium. This is, uh, the rest of the paper basically doesn't feature in any of these. It's only the conclusion. Um, most people, even very familiar with Boltzmann's work, may not be aware that the way Boltzmann gets to this result is by a very, very odd thought experiment. The, the thought experiment barely features in any of these summaries. Uh, Ufink me mentions it once in passing, uh, and he is being about as thorough as anyone ever has. Uh, so what is it about this thought experiment that's clearly important enough to Boltzmann that he devotes nearly the entire paper to it, but isn't important enough to anyone following him to uh, do the same? Well, here's what we find out. So the question of the 1877 paper is uh, the same question that Boltzmann uh, addressed a number of times over his career. How do you get the irreversible dynamics of macroscopic thermodynamics out of the reversible dynamics of a Newtonian gas without putting in some sort of irreversible secret sauce in the mix somewhere? This is a question that Boltzmann has dealt with before, of course. Uh, his infamous 1872 paper, the H-theorem paper, uh, dealt with this uh, directly by uh, putting in a number of plausible seeming dynamical assumptions about a gas and showing that you could get from those to the uh, approach to equilibrium uh, without anything that looks too, irre uh, too irreversible. Though this paper seemed kind of magical when it was first published and it garnered a lot of immediate controversy from Boltzmann's contemporaries, particularly Loeschmann and Zermelo. Uh, so, uh, Boltzmann came under immediate heavy fire, and the critics did eventually figure out what had gone wrong. There was, in fact, some irreversible secret sauce in the mix, uh, in the, uh, the Stoschel Ansatz, uh, smuggled in a subtle sort of irreversibility uh, that wasn't evident to Boltzmann at the start. So, I think we can at least hit, as histor make a historian's guess that it was this sort of uh, failure uh, that made Boltzmann consider that he may be better off without uh, any of these troublesome dynamical, making any of these troublesome dynamical assumptions. They got him in trouble last time, after all. <laughs> can he do it without? Uh, and Boltzmann decided that if he can't make any dynamical assumptions, he'll just take them from somewhere else. Storebot is fine. So uh, first, a quick aside. Uh, Boltzmann's terminology isn't quite the typical contemporary thermodynamics terminology. Uh, uh, typically, uh, now we recognize two levels, which is the macro level and the micro, the macro state and the micro state. Uh, Boltzmann doesn't do that. He's actually got three. Um, but for purposes of this, we only need to worry about two of them. Uh, the state distribution, which is the uh, sort of number of molecules that have a particular uh, number of uh, units of energy overall, and the complexion, which is a specific way of uh, distributing the use of energy amongst the individual molecules. These are um, not identical molecules, and the complexion is uh, how you give some energy to each of them by name, as it were. Uh, so you can you can essentially read the first one as macro state with a with the asterisks, and uh, the second one is sort of unproblematic with macro state. So Boltzmann's uh, proof starts uh, in proper uh, Lakatoshian fashion with a proof sketch, a simple, uh, non-rigorous uh, claim for the idea. Uh, and it goes like this. This is actually from a conversation that Boltzmann had with uh, Loeschmidt uh, somewhat earlier in the pages of Nature, where Boltzmann got very worked up about uh, what he saw as Loeschmidt's total inability to understand what he was going on about. Uh, the proof sketch here is really simple. So the basic idea here is that if all the uh, microstates are, or all the complexions are equally possible, but equally probable, and you give it enough time, then you're probably going to end up in an equilibrium state in the end, because there are a lot more equilibrium states than there are non-equilibrium states. Just as how in the game of Lotto, every single quintet is improbable, as uh, improbable as the quintet 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so uh, 
the probability that the state distribution becomes uniform with time only arises because there are way more uniform state distributions as equilibrium states. There's a certain intu intuitive pull to this, right? Uh, but it's slippery. It's certainly not a proof. Uh, the majority of the 1877 paper is devoted to turning this hand wave into some actual mathematics. Uh, and you probably have noticed that the elephant has already wandered into the room here. Uh, we've got a lottery machine hanging out in our proof. A lottery machine is not a gas. So Boltzmann's first attempt to specify the, uh, uh, how this works goes like this. Let's start really simple. Something very much like a typical lottery machine. You've got a finite gas of n molecules, and they can uh, take on a uh, kinetic energy that's an intermul integer multiple of some value epsilon. Uh, and the total energy of the system is the sum of the uh, energy of all the molecules. He picks seven, because it's congruent with the metaphor. Um, so if you try to figure out uh, how many ways you can distribute the seven units of energy amongst the seven uh, uh, particles, you end up with this nice little combinatoric chart. Uh, the state distributions are there, and the number of complexions per state distribution, distribution is listed on the left. And you can see that for some of them, uh, you don't have very many ways to make uh, the one that has only all the energy of one particle, but so there are lots more to make uh, the more even distributions, where the ones where lots of particles have a bit of energy. Uh, but this is this is not probability. This is combinatorics. How do we get the probability? This is a long quote, and I'm not going to read it uh, in its entirety. But this is also the first instance of the word probability in the paper. It hasn't occurred until now. And Boltzmann is basically just asserting this. Let's say that the probability of, that you are of getting a certain state distribution uh, is the chance that you reach into a lottery machine and you pull out uh, the energy corresponding to that state. And he builds an actual procedure for uh, talking about how this lottery would work. He says, suppose we have a big urn containing an infinite number of paper slips. I say the urn is big. It has an infinite number of paper slips in it. It's probably pretty big. Uh, and on each slip is one of the numbers between 0 and 7. The number of slips with each number is the same, and they all have the same probability of being picked. So then we draw 7 slips from the urn, and note down all the numbers of them. If the, all of the numbers add up to 7, which as stipulated is our total energy for the system, then we have a valid state distribution for that system. If it doesn't, we just toss it out as zero. Now we do that uh, infinitely many times. And when we do that, we'll end up with some of the state distributions way more often than some of the others. Uh, since each number has the same probability of occurrence, and the same elements in a different order form different complexions, each possible complexion will occur equally often. Now, I think Boltzmann is being uh, careful with the actual procedure of the lottery, uh, just to make sure he doesn't get accused of uh, any of the paradoxes that can attend to infinitely large lotteries. Uh, uh, infinite large lotteries are somewhat slippery, uh, and I would recommend Sean Gordon's paper about infinite lotteries if you want to see how slippery they can actually become. But uh, note here that this is the first instance of probability in this paper, and it's also basically the closest thing to a definition of how probability applies to the gas that we ever get. Uh, there are no dynamical assumptions in this paragraph at all. Boltzmann hasn't said a thing about how gases work. Uh, do they have stochastic dynamics? Uh, Newtonian dynamics? It doesn't matter. All that matters is how a lottery works. And we're just going to uh, say that the thing that works for the lottery works for the gas. We've also smuggled in a couple of hidden lemmas, of course. Uh, you can't not. Uh, the most notable one, uh, which I was pointing out, I believe, first by uh, Yasuke, is that the total energy is expressed as a simple sum of the energy of all the individual particles, then none of the particles' energies depend on any of the other particles' energies. Uh, 
And that basically means that they are not interacting. Uh, this is an ideal gas. That's not a huge problem for Boltzmann, but it is a hidden, hidden lemma. Uh, also, this is less of a hidden lemma and more of a uh, latent fact. Uh, this has nothing to do with the gas. Why are we talking about gases? We are investigating what is essentially an obvious false claim. And it's not like Boltzmann can't have known that. Uh, we are dealing with a thought experiment that is uh, drawing an analogy between two things that are disanalogous in precisely the way that they would have to be analogous for it to be the analogy system to be a good representative of the analog. But that does not deter Boltzmann. We have started with a very small gas uh, with discrete energy units, very much like a lottery. If we're going to get anything close to an actual gas, we need to start talking about uh, a continuous energy variable. So uh, Boltzmann starts with the same lottery uh, and makes a couple of uh, changes. First, makes the value of n realistically large, uh, makes the value of epsilon small enough that we can consider it in an infinitesimal, essentially, uh, and uh, labels all the slips on the now extremely large urn uh, in values of this infinitesimal quantity. Uh, but then after that, the procedure is basically the same. We still draw slips of paper out of our urn for all n molecules, lay them out, count the amount of energy on those uh, particles, or slips, count the uh, numbers of uh, energy units on the slips, add them all up. If it's the right number, we're good. If it's not, we toss it and move on to the next. And if we do that often enough, we will get a distribution of all the complexions the gas can take on. Uh, or can we? It seems kind of like it's going to work, right? Energy is a continuous variable. Uh, check. Uh, lottery section, uh, selection procedure is continuous, more or less. Uh, just like kinetic energy. Should be fine, right? It is not fine. Uh, in what has been called a Maxwell-inspired coup de theatre, uh, Boltzmann reveals that this lottery actually totally undercounts the degrees of freedom of gas. Give you something more like uh, a gas that contains uh, cylinders moving on a two-dimensional plane, like a game of air hockey. Uh, perhaps that's a misplaced example. <laughs> uh, but we have learned something here by this failure, which is that the energetic degrees of freedom of the gas are important to this uh, derivation, even if as Boltzmann is assuming, the dynamics of the gas itself aren't. So this may be actually the place where a little tiny bit of physics enters the room. Uh, the one aspect of the lottery system that actually needs to be relevantly similar to the gas that it is modeling. Can Boltzmann fix it? Well, you know the answer. I wouldn't be talking about this if he couldn't. Uh, the trick to making the, adequate, uh, the lottery adequate to the gas that it's modeling is to essentially just increase the number of degrees of freedom that it's modeling. You start, with, instead of one lottery that has uh, units of epsilon energy, uh, you set up three lotteries with units of epsilon velocity. Uh, and this is what, this is basically our, our finish line here. Uh, Boltzmann even says that this is the right distribution. Uh, and then after uh, he's added it all, he says that, yeah, we've got the actual state distribution established in gas molecules. So I want to point out two things here. The first is that uh, each of the lottery machines we've talked about so far is one level less like a lottery than the previous one. We started off with a really simple claim that gas is like a lottery. And then we had to uh, sort of poke and prod that claim uh, over the series of uh, attempts and mistakes uh, until we got something that we could actually assert was true of uh, a gas would be a lottery. So each, each lottery becomes uh, less realistic, each gas becomes more realistic. And it's actually this last one that lets Boltzmann uh, uh, get to the thing he's been trying to get to the whole time. 
which is this quantity, omega, which is the multiplicity of the gas, uh, or he calls it the permutability measure of the gas. Uh, if you want to find the most likely state for a monoatomic gas, this is the one you have to maximize. Uh, this is not the end of the paper, though. Uh, Boltzmann actually builds two more lotteries acro uh, across the paper. One uh, which generalizes to polyatomic gases uh, with extra, their extra degrees of freedom. Uh, and one that uh, talks about, uh, uh, changes it to generalized coordinates so that uh, you can also use this in context in which a force is being applied to the whole gas. But despite the fact that uh, these gas models are starting to become increasingly realistic, Boltzmann is still willing to say that it is entirely chance that determines the state distributions for gas molecules. There's still no physics in here, no dynamics. Uh, it just never shows up until right at the very end when he wants to hook up this quantity to entropy. So now let's return to our uh, three uh, Lakatoshian characteristics that I laid out at the beginning. Uh, which, and see if they apply to this case. So I said that uh, thought experiments don't establish the truth of a proposition, but they expose the hidden contents of a proposition uh, of our scientific claims via some kind of dialectical refinement, and that, that, that dialectical refinement is often the legal testing part. Uh, and I think that that holds pretty well with this case. This uh, thought experiment didn't really establish the truth of anybody. Uh, it uh, never really made a claim about the real world at all. It only ever made claims about increasingly unrealistic lottery machines. Uh, and in the end, it showed that uh, via its success, uh, it showed that the dynamics of a gas are not a necessary part of the modeling of, for this, uh, are not necessary to establish the uh, multiplicity argument that can get you the approach to equilibrium from a, uh, from a gas. You don't actually need dynamics to do it. It doesn't matter if they're no Newtonian and reversible, says Boltzmann. Uh, they could be. They could not be. Uh, it just never comes up. The second point, that thought experiment can investigate a false theory or an accurate representation just as truthfully as a true or accurate one, uh, also seems to hold up here. Nothing about this was even attempting to uh, resemble reality uh, in uh, any sort of Way. This is not a case of Galilean idealization, where we have simply effaced off uh, the inconvenient air resistance for our uh, purposes. No, this is a big lie in the right in the middle, and it still it still works. It still helps. Uh, and lastly, uh, one of the things that you can get out of your concepts intentionally, or your thought experiments intentionally, if you're doing it right, uh, is that uh, you can stretch your concepts a bit. Uh, by putting them in situations that they may not otherwise have been forced to consider. And I think that uh, Boltzmann has also done this here. The concept of a most probable state is what was being developed via this thought experiment, uh, which is a sort of reasonable extension of the concept of probability more generally. Uh, and of course, though it's less relevant, so we certainly stretch the hell out of the concept of water machine. Uh, and of course, uh, if I could throw to authority for a second, uh, in the foreword to uh, The Man Who Trusted Adams, a biography of, excellent biography of Boltzmann, uh, Penrose writes uh, that uh, one of the things that Boltzmann achieved uh, was to give precision to the very notion of entropy uh, by uh, identifying it with a specific multiple logarithm of the value in phase space uh, defined by the macroscopic parameters specifying the state of the system. Uh, he, he's claiming here that one of Boltzmann's central achievements was to uh, take these sort of loose con looser, uh, more nebulous concept of entropy and stretch it into a firm mathematical shape, uh, something that it would not have otherwise had. And I think Penner says it's just right. So, I think that um, my, if my claim was that uh, there is a, there are a couple of uh, lessons we can take from proofs and reputations that can be fruitfully applied to thought experiments in science. This is just one example, but I think it's uh, our proof of concept at least. Uh, this is a thought experiment that would be otherwise extremely perplexing to any other account of thought experiments in the literature. 
It is not a luminous platonic aha. Uh, it is not an argument. Uh, Boltzmann never argues for anything. Uh, and it's not even really uh, an investigation of what is possible, um, because none of it is possible. This is a thought experiment used to structure the process of creating a model from scratch and improving it until it works. And if that doesn't remind you a bit of proofs and reputations, then I don't know what will. A few further thoughts, if you have a second. Um, these are the directions of further research I want to move in on next. Uh, the nice thing about this case, the thing that I thought made it such a good example, is that Boltzmann himself does the whole uh, PNR process on his own. Uh, he starts off with a really rough, uh, rough proof sketch, and he moves until he's got something they can actually use. Um, but it may be the case that if we want to apply this kind of uh, framework to thought experiments more generally, we're better off looking at the uh, rich, uh, something more like what the actual conducts of proofs and reputations is reconstructed, a prolonged debate in the literature uh, in which uh, different people agree and disagree over whether or not parts of the thought experiment are reasonable parts to have or not. I think that might be a very useful way of uh, reconstructing the point of certain thought experiments. Uh, and I'm going to try that next. Uh, the other question I have is the question of whether or not Boltzmann's lottery would have been convincing to people of its own time if it had did not feature any of the lotteries but the final one. Uh, if Boltzmann had just skipped right at the end and hadn't built the lottery in that way, would it still have worked? I'm inclined to think the answer would be no. Uh, but this will require further historical research, uh, as I did further into the reactions to Boltzmann's uh, paper in his own time. Uh, and of course, the follow-up is that it's always presented without the lotteries now. What's the difference? Uh, we don't seem to be bothered by that when we do our introductory thermodynamics courses. One other tiny uh, thought, uh, which didn't even make it onto the slides, is that uh, one of the interesting kind of corollaries of proofs and reputations is that a lot of the time, the thing that mathematics is actually achieving is not necessarily what the mathematicians themselves think they are achieving. Uh, and if this is uh, an good way to think about thought experiments, that's also true of thought experiments. Uh, and given that it is us, the philosophers, who engage in the most thought experiments of anyone, uh, this may have to give us some pause if we're not actually doing what we think. All right, thank you very much.